Hi, and thanks for tuning in to Showcase, broadcasting around the world from our studios in Istanbul. Coming up on this episode, we'll break down the buzz surrounding the second season of the Netflix Marvel co-production, Luke Cage. Take you into the heart of modern Japanese culture, then head to England for a visit to Shakespeare's Rose, Europe's first pop-up theater dedicated to staging the Bard's plays. But first... Plucked from the past, the Malaysian gambus stands the test of time as it echoes the country's rich musical history. After sailing more than 5,000 kilometers through choppy seas, it wasn't long after arriving on Malaysian shores that the gambus was quickly embraced. Similar to an oud, the guitar-like instrument has given birth to its own musical genre and remains a way for both older and younger generations to express themselves through music, the almost forgotten sounds of the not-so-distant past. Abdullah is a professional musician who plays the gambus. The traditional Malaysian instrument was introduced centuries ago by Muslim merchants who sailed from Yemen. We call in Indonesia is gambus. Uh, the origin of this gambus uh, is from Yemen, Hadramaut. But now we have changed it. uh, its name to Gambus Johor because many makers and play, uh, Gambus players are from Johor. And then uh, in Malaysia we have two types of Gambus. The one is Gambus Hadramaut and this one. And the smaller one we call it as a Gambus Melayu. Uh, I choose this instrument, Gambus, because I fall in love with, with this uh, sound. The sound is very nice and also it is important to the Malaysian or traditional Malay music in a genre of Zapin and also Ghazal. So this genre of music, uh, they use gambus as a main instrument. During one of his travels to Turkey, Abdullah met a musician who plays oud, which he says is very similar to the gambus. The difference between uh, Arabic oud and the Malaysian gambus, uh, first is the material use. We use Malaysian wood and uh, the Arabic, they use uh, plenty types of wood that from all around the world. And then uh, the size and the design is a little bit different from Arab wood and uh, Malaysian gambus. And then the most important thing is the sound itself. The voice uh, there is different with uh, Arabic wood and with Malaysian uh, gambus. Abdullah not only plays the gambus, but he also makes the instrument at his own workshop. In uh, making process, gambus making process, actually we do several parts. Uh, from the head, then, then we make the neck, we call this the neck. And then we go to the body, and last we make the soundboard, this is soundboard. Then we, we fix it together, uh, we finish with a shellac or a any finish finishing uh, you can uh, use then you put the string put string here you can play for the elder generation here in malaysia the gambus is still their cultural instrument of choice saya mengetahui tentang gambus ni the first time i heard about gambus was from this group called seri 
Maharani Muar. At that time, it was not known, and I was attracted to Gambus when I was nine. Today I am 57 years old, and I hope Gambus will be introduced to the whole world. As Abdullah enjoys making and playing the gambus, he also makes sure to pass his knowledge by teaching the young generation how to play. I want to keep it alive with our traditional music, he told us. Still to come on Showcase, Cool Hand Luke Cage. Everybody talking about Luke Cage like he's Jesus. I ain't no joke. I used to let the mic smoke. The bulletproof black man. Marvel Entertainment's Urban Vigilante hits the streets of Harlem for a second season. We'll also drop in on the new cultural center in London that's showcasing the face of modern Japan. All of that station complaints against my child, my daughter, A Midsummer's Night's Dream come true as the first pop-up Shakespearean theater opens in England. We'll bring you those stories later in the show, but first let's take a quick look at a few of the latest headlines from the world of entertainment. American talent manager Joseph Joe Jackson has died at the age of 89 from pancreatic cancer. He was the patriarch of the Jackson family of musicians, including the late king of pop Michael and his megastar sister Janet. Joe Jackson formed the Jackson Five in the mid-1960s and went on to manage the group until they disbanded. Sony Music Entertainment has signed an exclusive deal with Prince's estate. The deal gives Sony the rights to distribute 35 albums previously released by the late musician. And starting this year, it will make available 19 albums Prince made between 1995 and 2010, including The Gold Experience and 3121. Items once owned by leading figures in the U.S. civil rights movement, including Rosa Parks and Malcolm X, are set to go under the hammer. They include Parks' home in Detroit, Michigan, as well as a two-page letter she wrote about her first meeting with Martin Luther King, just months before she was arrested in Alabama for refusing to give up her seat on a bus to a white man. The auction will take place next month in New York City. Interpret Simon Catalog, the black and toothy scarlet fog, walls of bad black fog. And moving on to Australia now, the town of Warwick is set to build a bronze statue of its homegrown international rock legend Nick Cave. The statue will be four meters high and will be sculpted by artist and Cave's friend Corin Johnson. The town's council says it hopes to raise the money for the project through crowdfunding. It wasn't until the 1970s that African Americans were finally able to watch their fair share of strong, positive portrayals on the silver screen. And after the success of movies like Foxy Brown and Coffee, comic book publishers also decided to cash in on this rising trend, largely by creating non-white superheroes that defended their own urban neighborhoods. Last year, four decades after he was created, one such character made a big splash with a web series praised for having a socially conscious narrative. And now it's back for a second season. In every business can squeeze them hard. In recent years, movies with African-American superheroes like Blade and Black Panther 
have revived an interest in storylines driven by multi-ethnic characters. Everybody talking about Luke Cage like he's Jesus. I ain't no joke. I used to let the mic smoke. The latest franchise to join this fad is Luke Cage. Marvel Comics created its hero for hire at the height of the Black Power movement in the 1970s. Really, guys? You gotta know we tried, man. I ain't no joke. And it became one of the symbols of the decade as a positive role model for young, non-Caucasian readers. And now he has taken over the small screen with a new show. And believe me, Luke Cage is nothing but a man. In its second season, the urban vigilante will once again step up to the plate to keep New York City safe from villains. Just like the city it's set in, Luke Cage aims to bring more racial diversity to popular entertainment. Not invulnerable, Luke. Anyone who can take you on bare hand, it can't be good for Harlem. I feel like many of the depictions that are taking place in, in contemporary, you know, film and television is definitely um, speaking to that and, and, and moving the conversation along. How I'd like it to, to be is instantaneous, right? But nothing in life happens that way that's worthwhile or that lasts. So I think I'm okay with the progress that we're making. In fact, I'm, I'm hopeful and um, excited. And, and shows like this, um, Luke Cage and, and movies like Black Panther, um, disprove a lot of the myths, you know, that, you know, these shows can't sell or that, you know, there isn't an audience for them that is outside of the community that they're a reflection of. So... You know, it's step by step, um, but again, I feel like we're, we're, we're making strides. Bushmaster, what makes him so scary? And the talent involved in the show say it's time for Hollywood to move on from offensive stereotyping that has plagued it for so long. I've seen you raw. I feel like we have run the gamut. We have already done like shows where it's just one-sided. And that even, you know, you get movies about Egypt with characters that are not Egyptian, that don't reflect that demographic. That's all like, it's corny, you know? And, and those movies not doing well and movies like Black Panther doing well, I think are indicative of what we're ready for as a, as a planet. Um, because, you know, the numbers, the numbers are international. Harlem doesn't need a hero, it needs a queen. Industry insiders say, due to the show's global popularity, Luke Cage will likely return for a third season at the end of 2019. I'm not in the market for a uh, sidekick. Who says you're not my sidekick? Me? It's my show. To speak about why the chances of having a third season of Luke Cage is high, I am joined by John Carlos Evans. He is a filmmaker, musician, and staff writer at Black Nerd Problems, where he has penned his own thoughts on Luke Cage. Thanks so much for being with us today, John. Now, in your review, you say that um, the second season of Luke Cage erases all the misfires of the second season of Jessica Jones and Iron Fist. Uh, how exactly does it do, does it do that? So with the second season of Luke Cage, you really have something that focuses on character building, community building, and world building around Luke Cage himself, which takes place in Harlem, New York. Uh, the biggest issues with Iron Fist and Jessica Jones' second season were that a lot of the characters felt flat, and a lot of the emotional drama was stretched in such a way where it was so thin, you really can't relate to the characters in the way that the first season of Jessica Jones was so successful. And what we have now in the second season of Luke Cage is something of thoroughly drawn characters who are primarily African-American or Afro-Diaspora with the Jamaican connection in this season. And so you have something that fully, fully like explores the depth of these relationships, both in the community and outside of it. I mean, when you look at Jessica Jones, the second season, the biggest issue is that it drawn out this issue of uh, her mother, and this was kind of like the main conflict of that season. But it was never so, it wasn't done in a way that felt compelling or felt real. And when you see the second season of Luke Cage, you see that the, the main ethos of Mariah, Black Mariah, the main character played by Alfre Woodard, her ethos is family first, family first. And this is something that really speaks to a traditional African family tradition where the family is a nation. The family well, speaking, is its own unit. Exactly. The family itself is an empire. Well, speaking of family, uh, do you think the show has gained a lot of attention because 
One of its main themes is family and the role loyalty plays when it comes to family. Yes, definitely, definitely. I feel like that pulls people in outside of the superhero spectrum. I mean, most of the people I know who really like Luke Cage have never read a comic book in their lives. You know, the same people who potentially saw, would see something like Black Panther would also watch Luke Cage because it speaks to something of their own sensibility, their own culture, their own background. You know, whereas they may not be interested in Captain America, which is a very specific superhero with a very specific history. But if you approach something like Luke Cage, where it's more cultural and family oriented, it brings in so many more more people who are interested in seeing something like that, especially if it represents themselves and it's a reflection of themselves. Like for me, the biggest strength of it was that it takes place in Harlem and it makes the situation so specific that they're actually universal. Mm -hmm. Now, what did Luke Cage as a superhero represent in 1972 and what does he represent now? Well, well, I think definitely there's a big difference in how that character is perceived now. Like in the 70s, the character really came off as kind of, uh, it was influenced by black exploitation films, you know? So it has this kind of jive talking impression of a black person that's really a white person's impression of a black person. It's a white portrayal of a black body and not a black portrayal of a black body. And so what you have now with this it's season of Luke Cage that we've seen through the Netflix series is that it's a look into the black community, black issues, black family, you know, African history worldwide through the lens of the people that it's actually coming from instead of it being done from an outsider. Well, talking about race, now when the first when the series first came out in 2017, it was criticized for not having enough non-black characters. But chances are, if the tables were reversed and it had an all-white cast, no one would have even noticed. Do you think Luke Cage marks a kind of a sea change in terms of the amount of screen time given to non-white characters? I don't think it marks that, but I think it's part of that wave. I mean, because of the system that we live in, we live in a, a world system that is basically dictated by global white supremacy. So if you have anything that speaks against that, you're going to have some pushback. You're going to have people who say, oh, well, why aren't we here? Why aren't we in this? It's like, but if you're in the dominant society, you're always represented. You'd never really have to fight for your voice to be heard. And so Luke Cage is part of this wave of media and art where it's saying, this is our voice. We don't really have to have you a part of it because you're not a part of it. It's like if not everything is about you, sometimes things are about us. And there's nothing wrong with something being about us. And the more the things that we can make of our own, whether it, if you're Asian, whether if you're African, making your own art and presenting your own culture enriches other people way more than someone else making an impression of your culture. Well, John, how critical do you think it is in this day and age to have a TV series like Luke Cage? I think for me it's super critical because one of the most subversive things about that series is the fact that it focuses on a bulletproof black man in Harlem. That alone is going to attract millions and millions of people, you know, African American and otherwise, within the United States and around the world. People who do feel oppressed and who are oppressed. And so by having this, it's saying, no, we're still here. We have a hero of our own who is bulletproof in a sense. He can't be harmed. Like, no matter what you throw at us, we can take it and we deflect it and we turn it into something beautiful, something more powerful. So I feel like it's a strong, strong image for children to have, and even adults, people who haven't seen something like that before. Like most of the time, if you're looking at an African-American series, it focuses on, maybe it's focusing on like music, and stereotypically mm -hmm. it's going to be hip hop music or like R&B music. Or you're looking at like a family drama, and that family drama will somehow involve like a broken home, you know, playing on tropes that really have no basis in reality but they're things that are more so stereotypes that are projected by the dominant culture. So with Luke Cage, you're able to kind of deal with these things in a great dialogue and make it very literate and very, also it's very academic. Because mm -hmm. if you just watch the series itself and pay attention to the small clues of uh, The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison, um, dealing with like the history of the Maroons from Jamaica, this culture, there's so much depth within that series that you could have a college course of that on its own. And within that course, you have the entire range of African-American, Afro-diaspora history. Well, John, I'm really glad that Luke Cage came to be, and I really hope that more characters that represent 
different cultures and races are created. Thank you so much for being with us today on Showcase. Thanks for having me. To London now, where the very best of Japanese art, design, gastronomy, and innovation can now be found under one roof. Japan House is a new cultural center in the city's core that hopes to raise the country's profile as Tokyo prepares to host the 2020 Olympic Games. A little slice of Tokyo on the streets of London. Japan House is a new $70 million treasure trove of all things Japanese. But you won't be seeing any kimonos here, as the center focuses on the East Asian country's modern culture in all its various forms. It's to show to the world what Japan is and what Japan will be, because we have futures and we are not just looking back in the past, Although we have a long tradition, the present and the future is going to be very, very promising. The center is spread across three floors that feature artworks, fashion pieces and handcrafted items. This project has been about three to four years in the making and obviously the Olympics does feature quite largely. But I think there's a bigger motive here, which is about expressing contemporary Japan to a UK audience. Um, you won't see in here pictures of Mount Fuji, you won't see geisha, you won't see lanterns, but you will see contemporary Japan, you'll see beautiful handmade objects, both for sale and on show in exhibition. The center also has a collection of books ranging from Japanese arts and culture through to tourism. What's really struck me is that Japan embraces the everyday um, and culture is part of the everyday. So taking a bath, having a tea um, has a ritual around it. And I think Japan enjoys the beauty of the functional. You'll see around here lots of very functional items, but they are extremely beautiful and the amount of work, precision, the detail that goes into those, I think, is a very important expression of Japanese culture. With a variety of interests to explore, Japan House invites visitors to immerse themselves in Japan's rich and diverse culture. Another one of London's cultural hubs is of course the Globe Theatre. Built in the late 1500s and situated on the banks of the Thames, it has since been the premier staging ground for the plays of William Shakespeare. And now a temporary mini version has popped up outside the city. And as Nursana Tutar tells us, for fans of the Bard, to go or not to go is never the question. No, this is not Shakespeare's Globe in London, though it's a similar pop-up theatre built in York, England, and it's called the Shakespeare Rose. It's not a replica of anything in particular, it's what Shakespeare and um, Henry Cundell, my ancestor, would recognise as a Shakespearean theatre. It's 13-sided, um, it's um, three storeys high, it seats 660 people, it's got 300 standing. Um, and it's going to be the home for the next 10 weeks of four great Shakespeare plays, new plays, new, new productions. The actual structure started and was finished within about 17 days. And it's, it took about 11,000 man hours to build it. Um, and 40, 40, 50 trucks on site um, to build that. And so, I mean, somebody said, oh, I expected it pop up. I thought it was inflatable. I went like, no, it's not inflatable. <laughs> Back in the day, Shakespeare's troupe visited York, but there are no official records to say he was among them. For locals, as well as the actors though, that's just small detail. Um, it's open air, it's made out of scaffolding, 
it's incredibly exciting to be in. As soon as you step onto the stage, it feels very intimate and it feels like you're kind of being embraced by the audience. It's true, nobody's more than about 15 metres away, which is, which, is, which is really special. And yeah, and also pop-up, I mean, it's been called a pop-up, but it didn't pop up. This was like so much effort and, and gargantuan amounts of work and design, but I really think it's worked and I really think it's paid off. The theatre will stage some of Shakespeare's classics, such as Romeo and Juliet, Macbeth and A Midsummer Night's Dream prior to its closing on September the 2nd. Well, that's all the time we have left on this edition of Showcase. You can head to our YouTube channel for more of our stories about the global art scene. I'm Afnan Han. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.